Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next installment of Metacell's webinars. Uh, today, we've got a great set of panelists to talk about intersections between deep learning and neuroscience. Uh, I will say that uh, the conversation today is really to try to cast uh, our understanding of both sides. Uh, I think it's a field where there's actually very few people who are expert exactly at that intersection. Um, so what we've collected today are folks who are strong and on the neuroscience side and strong on the deep learning side. And we wanna have a pretty open conversation to um, basically try to unpack what are the issues in this, in this space, in this overlap space. Uh, I'm Steven Larson, I'm the CEO of the company. Um, and I just wanna say a little bit about Metacell before we get going and introduce our, our panelists. Um, so we are a software company that works to develop uh, software that helps folks share their data and models online, uh, creating uh, compelling visual and collaborative experiences. So we are excitedly working at this space between all sorts of engineering technologies, whether it's AI or whether it's the latest in big data, the latest in cloud. We're really excited to bring those things to the neuroscience space because it's a space where it can benefit from a lot of technology. Um, we uh, work in web, native, mobile uh, devices. Um, we have deployments that uh, work internal to organizations as well as outside. Um, we really bring folks who have been trained up in neuroscience at the PhD level uh, into our organization to build first-in-class technologies. Um, we do things in agile development cycles and in continuous feedback loops with our clients. And this is a list of some of the folks that we worked with in the past and continue to work with. We really like spanning the gamut from uh, initiatives in academia and initiatives in industry. And we think that provides a really interesting scope uh, between those two worlds. So um, our webinar today, um, we're, uh, we really are graced with um, uh, three really bright guys here uh, to, talk, to talk with us. Uh, so we've got together with us Luca Biazzoli, who's a senior researcher at the University of Oxford. Luca has many years of experience developing and validating MRI acquisition and analysis methods, such as image registration, segmentation, and classification algorithms, and applying them for in vivo characterization of cardiovascular disease, uh, with particular attention to uh, atherosclerosis. Um, secondly, we have uh, Raj Ricky who's a senior program manager at Microsoft AI and Research. Uh, Raj has worked on many deep learning projects, currently at Microsoft and more recently at IBM, including Watson, NLP, Vision, Power AI, and Onyx. And then uh, rounding out our panel, we have Chris Littlewood, who's co-founder and director of data science and innovation at Filtered Technologies. Chris leads work on algorithm development, data analysis, and new product R&D at Filtered, an award-winning provider of personalized training. So gentlemen, thank you again uh, for being with us. I Thanks thought I'd kick, me. yeah, thank you guys. So I, I thought I'd kick off the conversation with a, with a, just a few ideas to, to level set us here uh, as we get into this. So, you know, deep learning is something that's uh, making a splash. There is a long list of exciting developments in the space of uh, gaming, of speech recognition, of um, image segmentation and recognition. And the one that caught our attention most recently was uh, DeepMind's demonstration of StarCraft that used, of course, a host of algorithms uh, behind the scenes, but, but um, you know, in many ways is taking advantage of the latest and greatest in deep learning and, and machine learning. And of course, this was an example of uh, human players playing against uh, an, an AI uh, human players who have a very high level of expertise in a game StarCraft, which is a real-time strategy game that also uh, in involves a lot of real-time decision-making and is a lot of complexity. And we were, you know, sort of surprised and excited um, and a little worried about the possibilities uh, that were coming from the um, ability for algorithms to really actually wipe the floor with the the human players in under controlled circumstances um, in the space. And it really felt like there was, it was time to take a look at how um, this is, uh, technologies like this are starting to uh, filter around the world and into other uh, domains, such as 
uh, neuroscience. And so we've seen AI in neuroscience for quite a while. That's actually not a new thing. Um, as um, algorithms have improved and evolved, folks have been continuously applying them in different areas of neuroscience. Of course, neuroscience has a very vast set of data types and, and a vast set of problems. So we just, you know, sort of looking at some things that have happened in the in the last few years. Um, you know, we noted some interesting results that have come out looking at neuroscience images and Alzheimer's disease, um, a deep learning model being used in particular to, according to this article, predict Alzheimer's disease six years earlier than when it could be um, diagnosed in the clinic uh, just by looking at uh, images. A very exciting prospect with that. And then um, also examples where speech patterns are being used in a similar way to try and see if you could also predict uh, Alzheimer's disease just by taking the audio stream of someone speaking and um, distinguishing between folks who are not going to develop Alzheimer's and people who are. So that kind of predictive challenge um, is really interesting and exciting. And of course, we have this, uh, con you know, we have Alzheimer's disease as a condition which has a vast unmet need in uh, therapeutics, uh, in pharmaceuticals, in really any methods of, of addressing it in terms of care. And so it is, uh, you know, it is projected to be uh, one of the leading causes of, um, of poor health uh, around the world, um, especially in, in first world countries. Um, into the next decade. So it's it's a really critical burning need. It's something that, you know, we all kind of take really seriously. So if there are ways to apply new technologies like deep learning to, to help us in this space, that prospect is really exciting. Um, and, um, you know, we don't know where that, where that could lead us. But of course, we realize that um, AI and deep learning is, is not a holy grail. And um, chatting with these guys here uh, in, in preparation for this webinar, you know, we really helped to kind of, you know, pull out and tease out some of these challenges and, um, you know, reviewing some materials that uh, in this space, we found that folks are kind of thinking about this a little bit in, in two ways that, you know, um, you go about trying to solve a, a challenge in, in neuroscience. And one way to go about doing that in neuroscience or in biology in general, in the life sciences, I'd say as a whole, is you might have this mechanistic discovery approach where you start with an understanding of what's happening biologically, you sort of test hypotheses, and then you iterate on those hypotheses by, you know, running experiments um, and improving that, and you and you hope for some good results. And and largely, biology is advanced in this way. And and I think we've had a lot of really uh, valuable uh, results and a lot of uh, therapeutics that have come out of this and a lot of advances. But uh, but it has some limitations. We'll talk about in a minute. Um, as AI is coming into uh, the fold, there is. Um, a broader class of uh, approaches that AI is one of them, where empirical discovery is being used. And this is what we'd sort of call the big data approach. And here the idea is just start by gathering a lot of data and then sort of throw algorithms at them or, you know, uh, or methods to kind of distill what you've got out of that data. And again, hope for some good results, hope that you get some discoveries and some insights that can then lead back into the scientific process. And I'm, of course, vastly oversimplifying for the purposes of discussion. But what, what we're sort of seeing is that this, the first approach, which, which is traditional and which we see a lot of, you know, in, in, in academia and, and also in industry and R&D is, you know, is helpful and it's great. But what we're starting to run into in the modern era is that, you know, biology is sort of uh, infinitely complex. I mean, it's not fully infinite, but it is really complicated. And every time you get a hypothesis, you sort of scratch the surface and find another level of complexity underneath it. And I think some of the frustrations with how complicated biology and neuroscience are is creating a motivation to kind of, you know, take advantage of tools that we have with data, collect data together and start applying algorithms like the ones that I, I showed you in those articles just, just before. Um, so this is sort of a revolutionary new approach, but it's not a holy grail. And as we're seeing, you know, there's actually still some pretty high error rates and you can go pretty far down the road of applying um, machine learning, AI, deep learning to biological data sets before you maybe take a step back and realize that, you know, we're seeing some predictions and we're getting some results, but they're not actually proving themselves out when we go back and check them uh, in the lab. And so there's a concern, not with the algorithms themselves, but with how eagerly and maybe over eagerly we might apply those um, in, in this space. So, um, that's just kind of the like a starting point for us um, here in this discussion. 
and I have some, uh, you know, some topics for us to uh, cover today. But um, I'm going to right now sort of pause and sort of say, um, first of all, to our, our audience here, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, you have the ability to drive the conversation today. Um, you'll find in the software uh, for this webinar the ability to type a question uh, into uh, the question box, and we will receive those on our side. And uh, I'm going to try to do my job to um, filter those into the conversation as we go here. Um, so we'd love to hear anything in this space that you're curious about. And again, we're going to try to answer them and approach them from, from our perspectives. Um, but um, basically, let me, um, at this point, before I get into sort of my topics, um, let me allow um, uh, Raj, Chris, and Luca to say a little bit more about uh, themselves and maybe uh, kind of things that they think are interesting in this space also to uh, get the conversation started. So let's go ahead and start with Luca. Hi. Well, my background is uh, in physics. Then I moved to image analysis and machine learning, and my PhD at Oxford was on magnetic resonance imaging applied to the cardiovascular system, say carotid and aorta, uh, with particular attention to atherosclerosis for the, let's say, in, in the context of uh, stroke prevention. And um, well, my experience is uh, with working with clinicians and patients so i was based i'm based in a, in a hospital uh, and uh, so it, my work is very multidisciplinary so it's linked to link the machine learning and image analysis image processing with uh, the image acquisition from the uh, using the mri scanner and having it to be relevant to what the clinicians the cardiologists need to uh, um, get in terms of diagnostics. Great. Uh, thank you. Can we go also to uh, Chris? Sure. Um, so maybe um, if I explain how we came to to um, start to use deep learning in in our company and in the work that we're trying to do. So we, we um, as Stephen said, we do personalized um, training. We're trying to um, deliver content to people that's particularly relevant to the skills that might have value for them. Um, and we started off doing that rules-based. Um, we had subject matter experts who would write um, a mechanistic rule, as um, Stephen described in the sort of um, original biological approach. Um, uh, and then as we tried to scale that and as we got um, more users, we started to use classical machine learning to tell us something about what people might like. So we'd build a picture of um, learners um, from what we knew about them, from the way they used the product or from what they told us, uh, and then use machine learning to try and um, uh, learn from usage and deliver content that's going to be particularly relevant. And then, um, just as Stephen was saying, um, in um, the neuroscience application, you sort of run into the complexity of biology. We sort of ran into the complexity of um, uh, content, essentially. So we wanted to expand out from our own content and make recommendations from anything that people might use to learn. Uh, and that was when we started to think about deep learning um, as a way of essentially embodying human decision making, trying to um, develop, get a training set that was based on um, a lot of human decisions about what content does or who it might be good for, and then um, use that to train uh, a neural network to do the same or similar thing. So yeah, that's my, I, I find it interesting that the parallels um, uh, between the fields. Absolutely. Great, and let's go to Raj. Hi everyone, great to be here. Um, I'm in a bit of a, I guess, <laughs> co-tangent <laughs> industry uh, and being in technology, I've, I've worked uh, in, in AI for uh, the better, folk, better part of the last uh, three or four years. Um, prior to that, my background was primarily in uh, scaffolding and infrastructure for supporting software applications, which interestingly enough, lend themselves um, to the other side uh, of doing deep learning, which is how do you actually get the things done? Um, and I found uh, more interest on the applied side of uh, uh, deep learning and ML, uh, particularly for applications 
uh, that look at uh, NLP. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I guess my recent focus has now shifted much more towards uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, and how you utilize uh, reward functions in concert with CNNs uh, to achieve specific outcomes. Uh, in the context of uh, things like uh, industrial applications, uh, manufacturing, et cetera. So uh, it's definitely uh, exciting to take a look at um, the scale of with which we're examining those applications in context of, of neuroscience. So excited to be here. Great. Thanks, everybody. So maybe we could just kick it off with something that's relatively uh, straightforward. I, I sort of talked about <clears throat> Alpha Star. Uh, my personal worry is that we're going to uh, create Skynet. For, for all of us as a result of seeing those uh, those AIs beat those humans. Um, but more broadly, I'm curious how you all see why, why it is that we're here today. What are some of the milestones along the road, uh, looking back uh, over the last five years that have caused all this interest and excitement in deep learning, the things really prior to uh, Alpha Star? Why, why do we think that there's so much of a excitement and interest in this particular uh, form of AI? Well, starting, can I start with um, it, machine learning has, has been showing very interesting results for quite many years before the, let's say, this renaissance of, uh, of neural networks uh, a few years ago. Uh, I think we have been struggling with, uh, in particular, in the medical um, imaging um, say a uh, field uh, we've been struggling a lot with uh, the data sets and uh, in the last few years there have been uh, more population uh, studies uh, such uh, uh, such as the uh, ADNI the uh, Alzheimer's disease um, neuroimaging initiative on which that paper that you mentioned is using for the training and testing uh, or the UK biobank uh, which is going to have 100,000 uh, scans in a few years' time. They're up to 35,000 now, uh, which is, is going to be the, the biggest uh, data set for, for MRI. Uh, they also have all, all the genomics, all the, the other, um, the other uh, more conventional tests, also ultrasound and so on and so forth. On the entire body, so cardiovascular system, brain, uh, and uh, with this kind of data sets, we're starting to be able to uh, apply machine learning effectively, as has been done in the last few years in the computer vision uh, field, uh, uh, where the, the data and the ground truth, let's say the gold standard, is, is, is easier to obtain. Let's say you need a radiologist, you need an expert cardiologist to have a to, to, to get your, your, your ground truth data uh, on which you can do the supervised learning uh, medical, in the medical imaging or any other uh, biosignal, let's say, that you want to classify automatically. So that's, I think that's why in the next few years there will be a very exciting period of time for, for the medical imaging and let's say, the medical signal. <laughs> Biomedical signals and classification. It's, it's, it's going to be yeah very interesting to see what happens. Yeah, great. And and Roger, Chris, you guys can just speak to even the you know non-applied advances in you know ML and, and deep learning that have caught your attention that you think are impressive or success stories in the, in the last five years in, in any other domain. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the touchstone for us was again um, a, a deep mind story. So the um, AlphaGo um, and the success at um, it, it's that um, approach of um, so so the story that we tell is sort of when they first built AlphaGo and um, were training it, then they trained it to play like a club player. They used the the data set um, of a lot of club games trained um, AlphaGo to emulate that play before before iterating um, uh, to, to improve where it could be um, Lisa Dahl and KG. So it was that that sort of was ah we can use this we can um, we have a lot of examples of humans making um, decisions that we can try and try and emulate. So 
so that was the sort of aha moment for us. Um, and then in terms of what enabled it, so obviously there's the sort of data and the um, speed of processing, but practically for a small business who isn't really sort of setting out to be an AI specialist, we're trying to apply AI, um, it's just the availability of the tools and um, the fact that we can, you know, get access to TensorFlow, um, get access to processing power and, and, uh, and do that, um, do the sort of stuff ourselves. Raj, what are you seeing on that? front yeah i i think um it's certainly interesting to see where the the focus and the attention has been in um with respect to uh ml and deal i think in in particular in the last couple of years um general adversarial networks as i was kind of mentioning before the call have, have turned to uh particularly in the context of uh, alpha, you know, Star, Alpha Go, uh, and DeepMind, um, a, an area of focus and research that has yielded results. Uh, but I, I, I think that the enrichment of the different types of off-the-shelf components that we've been able to get in terms of DL have certainly advanced the field, and particularly practitioners, uh, in a very meaningful way. Um, some of those things that I you know, sort of call out or the kind of behind the scenes in technology, uh, the the latest advances that you have in terms of uh, text processing, like for example, translation uh, sequence to sequence uh, being released, you have uh, a great many uh, different types of, of new uh, embedded deep learning frameworks uh, coming out there, which I think are starting to uh, be of more value in the medical field. In particular, I think there's a lot of applications for demonstration learning. Um, as you have these expert practitioners, uh, those of whom maybe, you know, calling out neuroscientists or those who are operating uh, devices such as MRI machines, the ability to translate those actions directly into uh, learning and trial runs outside of, you know, just the, the, the batch runs and the hidden layers of the convolutional neural networks that you have in DL. Uh, I think are, are significantly going to advance the field. Um, and so, you know, regardless of the level of scale that you have, even if you're not looking at things like, um, you know, uh, hundreds of pictures of cats, right? Uh, or yeah, even images, right? Uh, MRI imaging, uh, you have the uh, opportunity to uh, operationalize and actually accelerate artificial intelligence in multiple contexts with limited data sets. Yeah. I, I, th I think you guys all touch on different parts of this. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth calling out that um, the availability of tools and open source uh, have been a thing that has driven this. Um, the availability of open data sets, so ImageNet in a particular one, where there have been sort of a decade of uh, in, in increasingly improving techniques for segmenting images. Um, also doing segmentation on, um, well, segmentation or understanding of speech um, is a thing, right? We are all talking to our <clears throat> phones now uh, in ways that we couldn't do before. And so there's been obviously a lot of investment also from you know big, big tech companies in this space that have made it easy to get at these tools. And they feel that you know opening these tools up for folks to use is a, is a strategic advantage for them. So those are also things, you know, um, the, Alpha Star example was a case where this game company, Blizzard, also had to make available a version of their game that you could do AI with. So there's kind of a lot of folks that are playing their part now, I think, to, to move some of these technologies forward. And I think that's what's also interesting is that as, as we see the, the way that the road has been carved out in these other domains of data, now to go into places where you need more expertise, like neuroscience, um, but there's others as well, and now start to see what what it requires to go from say uh, telling cats, uh, you know, like, like telling you telling you what image has a cat in it, versus you know whether your brain looks like it's headed down a bad road of disease, right? Like what does it take to go between those? So um, uh, and the other piece of it, I guess too, is is the the, the game. So I want to ask you guys about games. Um, so you know I. I how do you go from this idea of I have a computer that's like the best player of Go or the best player of chess or the best player of StarCraft? And how do you go from that to the more serious domains that you all are working in, right? Help help folks uh, who are in this uh, in this room who maybe aren't deep learning experts 
you know, in, 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 in plain language, try to try to bridge how you go from playing games to, you know, doing things that are more um, like important, I guess. Yeah, I think. Go ahead, Luca. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I think what we're touching on, you know, or at least Stephen, what you touched on there is a form of a specific form um, or a specific approach called reinforcement learning, right? And the, the notion behind reinforcement learning is pretty straightforward. You have uh, different states, you have different actions, um, you have terminal actions, and you have a reward function. Right? And the reward function is designed uh, to either encourage or really a trend towards specific behavior. Uh, and in the context of, say, for example, uh, neuroscience, if you're presented with a host of different MRI images, what you're really trying to do is, yes, get a curated set of what you understand to be specific, um, maybe diseases, or you understand to be specific, uh, I should say, um, uh, you know, characteristics uh, of those images uh, and the ability to shape uh, and learn uh, and pick up those patterns. Say, for example, uh, a, let's say a reward would be um, to to try and identify a particular, you know, uh, uh, progression of diseases in a, in, in a patient over a host of, uh, uh, let's say, a window of time. Right. Uh, that's that's definitely an area that rhymes, even if it's not necessarily the same function. Uh, and as we continue to invest in some of these more off-the-shelf components, uh, it's important to kind of keep aware of, you know, although the subject matter may be different, uh, the understanding and the process of trying to map these two different areas actually ends up being somewhat similar uh, in that the concepts that you articulate to the system um, are, are, are not unique, right? Um, and what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's like, you know, trying to describe the different um, uh, methods of uh, how you get to the bottom of like a CNN, uh, you know, in terms of feature extraction and hyperparameter optimization uh, uh, in one area to the next, you know, maybe totally different subject matters, but understanding those individual components and stitching them together, I think, is how you get to the end state. And I mean, the way, um, I don't know if this is helpful, but the way I think about it, so our problem is, the, the problem to which we've applied deep learning is one of um, classifying text documents according to what skills that um, the, that text might refer to, um, which I think is structurally, it's actually very similar to an image problem, um, an image classification problem, um, in fact, and we use the same sort of technology to do it. But the way I think of what we're trying to do is, if you think about a document, then there is structure at lots of levels of that document. There's the sort of, um, there are specific words that might be characteristic or even um, strings of letters together in that document that might give away what it's about, or there are combinations of words, or there's like, you know, themes across the whole. And the way I think about applying um, a convolutional neural network to that problem is that it is working out for itself which of those levels are most important to that question of what what should I label it with? Um, so you're sort of, the process of training the neural network is just tuning this complicated machine that is taking that text as input and saying, yeah, um, because it's got th these words in it and because it's got these themes in it that at this level or, or whatever, then it, it's it's this sort of document. So yeah, I, I that, that's my mental picture of it. I don't know, as a as someone who isn't a computer scientist um, uh, and, and has, has, has learned this um, late. Yeah, I think there's, um, um, well, uh, I'm very cautious on this. Um, and I believe that machine learning has still to prove itself uh, on the most basic tasks. Uh, in terms of uh, segmentation and tissue classification, for instance, in, in the medical imaging uh, arena. Um, so um, once there are uh, out there um, publications in the literature with very strong evidence uh, that uh, can be applied on very different, different fields and anatomies, very different modalities, and from PET to MRI, 
to do these <clears throat> very important uh, steps in the uh, to, to get to the diagnosis to uh, aid the the clinicians to uh, be able to to make a more informative uh, inform, informed uh, diagnosis uh, will I think that there, this is the first step to 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 be to be yeah, to be done. Uh, once that is, uh, it, it, there are very promising results. So uh, it, it's it's just a matter of time and just a matter a matter of getting more data. And as I've mentioned before, the the bottleneck is mostly the standardization of data uh, the data sets and of uh, the availability of um, a good gold standard because there is a lot of inter and uh, intra uh, observer variability among radiologists cardiologists uh, neuroscientists when they are they are uh, kind of doing providing their diagnosis or their segmentations uh, so and that once that is done then uh, it would be uh, uh, I, I guess it, it will be an exponential uh, improvement because once that bottleneck is sorted, uh, you will have uh, adversarial uh, networks, you will have reinforcement learning uh, kicking in, and it, it, it would be very interesting to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want to bring out a couple of things uh, from that um, in the in, in the next question. But just as a reminder, if you're still if you're still watching, so this is the uh, webinar on intersections between deep learning and neuroscience. Um, uh, we would love to get your questions in here as well. I think now we sort of set the stage a little bit for the space. So please feel free to go in and type in a question for us, um, and we'll kind of uh, filter them into the conversation. So looking forward to seeing those come through. Um, so touching on that point, um, you know, Chris mentioned that uh, the work that he does is largely with text. <clears throat> and uh, I know that AI in general and machine learning techniques have, have a history of really being improved on data types that are plentiful. So we, we've talked about text and we've talked about images. Now those are some of the fun, most fundamental things that computers have been built to work on for quite a while, two-dimensional images, and text and so there's as a result there's kind of a lot of it it's more or less easy to have large corpuses of, of data in, in this way but Luca also says tells us reminds us that in the neuroscience space there's not yet maybe as much success uh, to be able to say like oh yeah deep learning you apply it to neuroscience and like you know you you win like I showed a couple of articles but those are pretty new and I think people are still kind of coming to terms with with what's there so um, can we talk a little bit about the data types uh, in this space that you can do, um, you know, machine learning and deep learning on, and what, um, and and the challenges of kind of getting a hold of that data, or in some cases of of generating it in the in the GAN case where you're kind of competing, uh, you know, you have algorithms competing with each other, and I think in some cases really just generating data for each other to to work again. So I'd like to take this one to Raj just to kind of talk a little bit about. Do you work with modalities of data outside of um, just text and two-dimensional images? And what are you seeing in that space for, for the diversity of data types that, um, that AI is being applied to? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think this is something that you, uh, as, as a, I want to say if you're if you're not a a, a research practitioner of, of LDL, you're you're going to certainly come across this issue of um, what are the given set of data types that I have and what types of transformations am I going to need to apply to them, uh, and frankly, what kind of stuff do I have out of the box that's available to me to to make them salient um, and preparatory uh, for uh, an ML model, right? So yes, uh, certainly. Um, text, both structured and unstructured text, uh, or un I should say, uh, yeah, unstructured data, right, uh, in the form of uh, large text blobs and certainly pictures and certainly video uh, are all different types of different uh, data types that you have. Uh, you're going to need to provide a uh, pre-processing pipeline uh, in order to 
uh, have the apply the appropriate features to um, in in technology. Certainly, uh, in our space, um, I've come across uh, unstructured objects such as you know large uh, uh, contracts uh, and uh, and uh, you know in form of text. Uh, we've also taken a look at weather patterns. Uh, you know, at, uh, at IBM and, and analysis of how do you uh, both look at individual snapshots and, and migration of patterns and what are the appropriate, you know, set of uh, pre-processing that you have to apply to those. Um, I, I think if you're trying to, if you're trying to get a sense of what you need to do uh, up front uh, to, to prepare yourself given a, I, I want to say, entropy of different data types, uh, you really want to start looking at um, what tools you have available to you for that given um, uh, for that for that given set of data types, right? Really, prior art. Uh, so, if you come across a set of images, um, there are certainly uh, open source tools out there, uh, given your level of sensitivity and what you're trying to to accomplish, that you can make use of uh, to both. Do things like vector conversion, or do things like, for example, uh, you know, whatever data engineering pre-processing you need to do um, that you don't necessarily need to be a expert in uh, in order to apply deep learning. Um, but I would argue that that's probably upfront the first step and the largest um, set of investment that you need to make. Uh, and and when you get to the point where you've applied the right transformations. That's when it gets easier to understand what kind of insights you want to actually drive. Yep. So I just want to draw a line between that um, and and neuroscience, really. So um, neuroscience is is a challenging domain for um, machine learning and software in general. First, because folks are just generally like, oh, it's about the brain, and like that's already like kind of mystifying, you know. If, if you haven't gotten into it because like the anatomy is complicated and all that kind of stuff. So first people just kind of stop at like, oh, brain stuff. Don't really know very much about that. And, but then if you get past that part, the second thing that makes it hard is that it's measured. The brain is measured in so many different ways. And you've got so many people who have applied computer science really creatively to take those measurements and turn them into some data format. And it's a data format that is weird compared to other data formats that are that there's a lot more of on uh, on the internet. So, uh, so in Luca's area, when we're talking about MRI, well, what is an MRI? It's a three-dimensional image, right? It's like a cube of data. It's like, uh, and so instead of dealing with pixels, you're dealing with voxels. And you know, three-dimensional images are you know present in other, obviously in other domains. But that's that's one. But that's just one of dozens of other kinds of sort of obscure data types, so like real-time signals that are kind of like audio signals, but they're not really like audio signals because they're taken from the brain or from a wearable device. And we just talked about this in an earlier uh, webinar. And then there's data that's relevant because it's in some clinical format. And then you need to know more about the data uh, than you usually do because usually it's in the context of some experiment. And so you can't just take it you know, at face value. You need to apply a lot of context to it. So here we're talking about you know intersections between deep learning and, and neuroscience. One thing to understand is if you just forgot it for a moment about the fact that the data are about a brain, and we kind of like set that part aside, and you were just like, okay, well, show me what are the data that you're dealing with. You're going to be dealing with often dozens of unusual data formats and data types. And so, Raj, I think your points are really valuable because anytime you're doing that, if you're, you're talking about weather, or you're talking about I don't know, uh, maybe contracts seem like they could be full text, but there might be another layer on top of that, like relationships between documents and full text or whatnot. But any any exotic data types, that's sort of what neuroscience is, it, that's what it's like to work in neuroscience these days is, is to like have to confront having that transform to take this obscure data type and do something uh, you know, valuable with it. So I wanna go over to Luca here and see if any of that resonates with you because you're kind of our resident like, guy on on images even if you know you're applying them maybe not to the brain but you're applying them even in another domain um what are the special challenges that come from dealing with with medical images that that you didn't see until you kind of got into that space so um <clears throat> well to conclude what uh, what you mentioned in terms of the different um sources of data in in the medical domain and neuroscience um i think 
very um, um, the great potential of machine learning is in uh, teasing out all the um, tiny weak relationships uh, between uh, different measurements, uh, which are could be difficult to to spot by by different by by a, a, an expert, let's say, or haven't got any clear mechanistic um, process uh, underlying the, uh, the, the relationship. So uh, the mechanistic part for the explanation could come later, but it could be a, a way of discovering um, uh, biomarkers and relationships uh, between, between uh, uh, for instance, MRI uh, uh, contrast in a region of the brain with the EEG signal, with uh, any other measurements with, with genomics, which is obviously it's going to be another uh, set of data uh, that will require uh, a lot of uh, data mining and machine learning in order to tease out the, those relationships. Um, and these are things that can't be really uh, found on a study with 100 patients that what we have been used uh, for for decades. That's the kind of number of patients that uh, in imaging, probably in genomics uh, a bit more, but now with uh, the few thousand, few thousand subjects, uh, we're starting to to do something in terms of imaging with 10, 20,000, you can add genomics and start to see uh, the, the relationship within with the genotype and a phenotype, uh, an imaging phenotype um, in different kind of disease. Uh, this this kind of relationship would be would would be uh, the, another very very important uh, area in which uh, machine learning will would be very useful. Um, uh, like for instance. Also, yeah, to talking about different uh, data format, uh, we've got yes, we three uh, MRI is is three D, uh, but we also have uh, the function functional MRI has got an activation, so it's really like a four D uh, signal. There are uh, in the case of cardiovascular medicine, for instance, there are four uh, D. Um, flow images where you can see the flow and these are can be used also uh, in terms of uh, uh, to uh, see where uh, uh, bolus of blood is going to in, in different parts of the brain and uh, um, correlating that with uh, uh, injuries or with with uh, with different kind of uh, degenerative disorders um, so uh, Data could be really complex. I mean, it's not just a single 2D image that we were used to see. Uh, so with four dimension, and then we add uh, monodimensional time time series uh, from ECG, DEG. Then it, it's it, it's starting to to grow uh, significantly, um, and uh, it's it's impossible to for 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 a person to look at all the differences uh, and all the correlations. Yeah. So if one challenge is that there's a lot of different data types, um, I don't want to shortchange the fact that there's still a lot of challenges even when you're dealing with one data type and a well-known data type. So Chris, as it sounds like you're dealing primarily with text, I don't want to shortchange <laughs> the idea that it's just easy because you're dealing with text. So yeah, help, help us understand, you know, even for that data modality where things are well worn like what are the challenges that you're seeing now even with all this investment all these great fancy tools and technologies like what's still hard yeah i'm i'm, I'm glad i don't have those additional challenges um the um so yeah I, we don't have a data structure problem i think we we face a, a trade-off between um sort of volume of data and um, applicability to our context or our domain. So there are lots of data sets um, with you know, huge corpuses of, of documents um, that are classified that we can use to train stuff, but those the, the context is different from ours. So just simple things like the um, application of the language is not to a, a training situation. Um, and so 
yeah, we, we face um, a, a decision as to whether to use something that's pure and, and focused on our um, on our domain or, or, or something that's voluminous. Um, uh, um, so that's that's one thing. And I guess the other thing, the, the other specific challenges that we face are to do with um, uh, what we're trying to optimize for, or what we're trying to um, improve. So, so generally, th there's a, a whole load of um, obviously machine learning and um, uh, and deep learning work on um, sort of optimizing for engagement or optimizing for um, people clicking on things, essentially, um, born of the web. Uh, whereas our um, our goal is a little bit different. We don't just want people to engage with things; we need it to be to be relevant. So, yeah. Great. Um, so, uh, sorry, those weird noises coming from my end. Um, so I wanted to, so I actually got, we got a question in as well that kind of um, jumps on that. Uh, and um, probably getting maybe to the one or two last questions. So folks, if you have any more, please, please put them in. But so it's sort of, so a deep learning or machine learning in general, if, if, whether you're um, giving it a set of uh, text documents to try and say, what content is in them or whether you're giving them images to segment or whether they're medical images or, or regular uh, images they build up some sort of a model in, internally in order to um, tell the difference between those and so we have a question here on on the interpretability of those so in the case of um, you know if we could imagine a future where you could go in and get an MRI taken of your brain and somebody could you could take that uh, that um, model and, and upload it to the um, a, a device that was built off of this paper that we just saw and the paper says that they are in their hands are able to predict Alzheimer's you know six years early let's say that you know thought experiment your your brain image goes up into this into the cloud and comes back and it says hey clock's ticking six years it's coming for you right you're gonna want to know why <laughs> you're gonna want to you're gonna want to have a really good reason to be like okay but do i trust that you know because you're gonna want to start making some plans like i, I kind of don't want to joke about it it's, it's like it's a really serious disease but but you are going to know want to know why and so um often these models in deep learning have been one of the concerns has been that you don't have a good explanation for why because you've left some of the mechanistic exploration behind and you've just done this on the basis of looking at a lot of data and pulling out a pattern and the best reason is just look your brain looks similar to these other brains that six years beforehand uh you know started to, to get alzheimer's so um some folks here may be familiar with this interpretability uh thing um so you know setting aside the question of neuroscience or not you know what is being done in the space to you know maybe improve this state of affairs this is a problem that, that you guys are seeing of an explanation for why a prediction comes out the way that it does and just generally, in any any thoughts on on interpretability? I guess um, it, it's something that crept up on us a bit. Um, the the need to be able to um, to describe and explain how things were working. Um, so, um, and I think this challenge of interpretability is to some extent sort of baked in to the. Deep learning, it's, it's part of its strength is that you don't need um, uh, uh, to define exactly what's going to be important up front. You don't need to say, um, yeah, what, what are the key features of an image or the key um, elements of a text document that are going to drive, um, uh, you know, how, how you should treat it, how it should be segmented. Mm -hmm. um, and um and yet we so where we work with with clients generally our users are in are in companies um and often those those companies need, need to be able to you know they want the, their people to trust the the tool that they've got for them they want to be able to explain how it's arriving at decisions um uh, you know people's data is being used by this tool they they want to know that it's um it, it's being used sensibly in our field there's um the challenge of um sort of silos we want to sort of be able to defend our game, ourselves against the um accusation that we're sort of reinforcing um just exist w w what's there already existing um views or existing skills are just getting sort of um reinforced so yeah we we face that challenge um from um 
from, from clients and and so we have sort of having to break open the black box a bit and with visualization and with um uh, you, you know with some storytelling try and show how decisions are being arrived at as an example at least now rod raj do you see any anything in this space that is helpful or is, is, is it a problem that you're confronting <clears throat> I certainly think that um, I certainly think of the context of trying to understand applications of inference from DL and ML models uh, to folks who are more used to the other side in terms of interpretability uh, of having you know a very clear and documented way of how you get to a result uh, is is a routine challenge. Uh, I think. Um, Part of what we have been able to accomplish with, say, for example, deep learning and having hidden convolutional layers uh, is that you are sort of abstracting away the complexity, uh, but you are also simultaneously abstracting away a lot of the rationale and, and path to understanding. Uh, and particularly when it gets to providing insights and particularly when it gets to providing, as an example, accuracy, uh, you know, an audit trail matters, uh, right? Um, especially to those who are experts in their field. So it's 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 good to, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about in the tech industry, as I guess as of lately, uh, is uh, bias and uh, uh, really, you know, an ethical approach uh, to AI and trying to create transparency. Uh, I think particularly in research applications, that's not just critical, uh, for peers and peerage uh, around how you get to a result, uh, but certainly, especially at, as you're socializing, not just with practitioners, but um, even you know, consumers, folks that are uh, not just neuroscientists, but like doctors and the like, um, being sure that you have a clear audit trail for how you explain those results and, and key on insights is gonna be important for interpretability, um, at least in my opinion. Now, Luca, you ever have a clinician concerned about uh, interpretability that you've seen? Yes, that, that's that's the main uh, issue for uh, them accepting these kind of techniques because it's obviously uh, seen as a black box and uh, rightly so. <clears throat> Sometimes they need more of just a, a correlation uh, to kind of be convinced that it's, it's, it's something useful. Although this is changing, uh, and I think there's more and more uh, acceptance, at least of the, uh, the great potential of these techniques. Um, probably um, it will be a bit, that it will be taken uh, on a bit slowly, uh, slower than in other domains, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it will be, at the moment, probably it's better and easier uh, to um, accept something that is uh, has got uh, like a set of features, for instance, that are uh, uh, kind of engineered and crafted, as they are called. Uh, so algorithm that could can be fully explained, and they practically resemble what you would be doing with your eyes looking at the images uh, and then having a final step that does the segmentation classification to, uh, using machine learning by you know, leveraging the, the the data you've got uh, rather than as used to be done in, in a set of uh, deterministic way uh, as you is you you you're thinking uh, it, it might be done uh, so it, it's 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 uh, it's promising, um, and it, it will be, I guess, it will be more accepted. And also, the deep learning will be more and more accepted because uh, the, the the amount of data uh, will will show that there are correlations, and the the, the results will will be accepted at least for as we were saying before. In terms of small steps, the segmentation is correct. That can be easily checked. Uh, in terms of getting to a final diagnosis, is 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 a bit more complicated. Uh, there will be intervention uh, and uh, 
so the result must be interpret interpretable from from yeah, the human experts. Uh, the intermediate yeah. results, I guess, uh, will always be have to be. Yeah. So there is a need of uh, having a bit more transparency of what what's uh, what's in, uh, the result of each layer in 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 a, for instance for you know, CNN and having you know, the feature map, the saliency maps, and and, and make them uh, understandable for for the end users, which are clinicians. Yeah. Taking the algorithm and breaking it apart, looking at some of the different layers. I heard about mm -hmm. um, visualizations as a thing, and then also audit trails that, that that Raj brought up as a thing that can address this. Well, everyone, this that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, Chris, Luca, Raj, thank you so much for the time uh, today and, and in preparation for this. We really appreciate it. Um, this is all going to be posted on our website. And just a, as a shout out, uh, we just upgraded our website uh, this week. So it's bright, new, and shiny. We're really excited about it. So if you haven't seen it this week, please uh, hit refresh on your browsers and, and check it out. Um, and stay tuned for the next Metasol webinar um, when we take on a, another exciting topic in this space. Um, we hope to see you there for that. Thanks to all of you for listening, and see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.